In last month's inaugural conversation, we heard from Dr. A.R. Siders and Erica Bowen, uh, who addressed many of the myths of managed retreat. Um, for this second installment in the series, we are fortunate to host Nadia Sidaram. Um, Nadia is a PhD candidate in the Earth and Environment Department at Florida International University. Her research seeks to understand how varying risks and vulnerabilities to sea level rise uh, over time may lead to different migration outcomes for coastal communities, uh, especially where climate adaptation and policy interventions are inadequate. She graduated from Fordham University in 2012 with a bachelor's in environmental policy and psychology, and then from Florida International in 2014 with a master's in environmental studies. She has uh, held research positions at the Governor's Office of Storm Recovery in New York, at the US EPA's National Exposure Research Lab in Athens, Georgia, and her previous work focused on monetary valuation of ecosystem services in relation to the restoration of the Florida Everglades. She's a former co-chair of the ComSciCon Miami franchise and helped organize the first ever ComSciCon in the state of Florida in 2019. Uh, with all that uh, scene setting, just a few logistical points before I turn it over to Nadia. Um, the, uh, this will be recorded as, as uh, I think you've seen. We'll then have a general question and answer period for all attendees. Uh, but we'll then excuse those participants who are not youth to allow for a youth only Q&A session with our guest. Uh, feel free uh, to use the chat window throughout our time together. I believe Nadia has some interactive elements to her talk, so please stay tuned for that as well. Uh, we'll be tracking the chat window and, and we'll be certain to bring up uh, questions or comments uh, for our speaker at the end. So with that, I will turn it over to Nadia and thank you all um, uh, for joining us today. Thank you, Dave, so much for that introduction. Um, I'm really happy to, to be here with you all today. It's such a joy, honestly, to, to be able to present this work and, and, and educate um, all and basically all of the lessons I've been learning throughout the course of my dissertation. Um, so today, my presentation is, let me share my screen, um, is entitled Fish in the Street and Rivers in the Concrete. And the reason I gave it such a funky title is because it really emerged from the stories um, that I've heard from Miami-Dade County residents. So a lot of my work is centered in Florida, most specifically Miami, and not really sure um, how much you know sort of about the, the area, but flooding is a really big ongoing issue for Miami-Dade right now. Um, and so that work really inspired me to kind of go out and just kind of talk to people about, you know, how are they feeling about flooding issues? Are they thinking about moving now or in the future? Um, what are the types of factors that would even, you know, uh, that, that, that they're even thinking about in a, in a big decision like that? Um, and so before we get started, and just to sort of help me out a little bit, I usually speak a lot to uh, different Florida residents. It'd be really helpful for me if you felt, um, if, if you would, if, um, if you could, um, you know, maybe type in into the chat and kind of tell me where you're joining from today or where you're from, just kind of helps me get a sense of uh, who the audience is. As I said, I mostly speak to a lot of Florida residents and they know a lot about flooding. And so uh, it's, it's really helpful uh, for me to, to kind of understand where people are joining from. Great. Awesome. Oh, great. Brooklyn, I'm a, from New York as well. I was born and raised. Wonderful. Um, yeah, thanks so much. Um, and the other thing I'd like uh, to ask you all to do um, is maybe keep your phones handy. There um, are some interactive elements within the, um, within the presentation and I'll prompt you. Um, and they'll be, they basically help keep this, uh, try to make this a little bit more of a conversation between the two of us, uh, between us, even though I know that's kind of difficult in these virtual environments. Um, wonderful, thanks so much, California, Annapolis. This is great. Um, okay, so uh, without further ado, I'll get started. So as I said before, sea levels are rising in Miami. And it's really to the point where even though we know that sea level rise itself can be these you know, small incremental changes you know, within a coastal community, it's having pretty big effects, I would say, uh, in Miami right now to the level that we are 
you know, kind of seeing uh, tidal flooding, which, you know, when, wasn't happening a few years ago, that flooding that kind of um, sort of comes with some of these higher tide seasons that we have, usually between September and November. Um, we're seeing a lot of precipitation or rainfall related flooding, meaning, you know, South Florida is one of these, you know, tropical areas and so, or subtropical areas. And so it rains quite a lot in our wet season. And if there is just too much rain at some point, that water doesn't drain out anymore. And we, you know, end up having quite a lot of flooding. Um, and so we can see this in, in Miami just all over the headlines. Um, these were, I, I took these screenshots, I think maybe two years ago, and they were all within the span of like two weeks. You know, these, these, uh, these conversations about, well, what are we going to do? How are we going to adapt to the sea level rise, this flooding? Uh, what does it mean for people who are living on currently safer areas in Miami? Uh, or is, the, uh, you know, is there this thing called climate gentrification actually occurring? Um, are we going to, you know, ha are, have buyouts? Are we going to have uh, sea level, um, sea walls? What exactly are we, how are we planning for this? And, and this really is just this ongoing conversation in Miami. It's, it's you know, despite what, um, you know, right now, I think, and, and mostly precipitated, I think, by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, a lot of people have actually moved to Miami. There's a tech, a booming tech industry. And, you know, against all of that, there's still this really big problem of, of sea level rise uh, in Miami. Um, so before we um, get started um, into, you know, talking about some of the results from the interviews, I'd, I'd love to kind of um, ask you some of these questions. And so um, to participate uh, in this, um, I'd like you to go to menti.com at the top of the screen. Um, you can see it there. And then there's, you can input that code. And your answers should sort of pop up. Um, I'd love to know what you think the main causes of sea level rise are. There we go, perfect, it's working. Yeah, melting land ice, thermal expansion, eight. And the change. Subsidence, ice melt. Um, yeah, these are all really great. Um, all correct. All right, I'm going to give it maybe just a few more seconds. You, yep, CO2 emissions, warming atmosphere, getting right to the root of the problem. Okay, well, these are all absolutely correct. This is a very, very smart bunch of, uh, of people here. Um, I should have anticipated that normally. People don't necessarily go into all the direct causes of, of sea level rise, but you're all absolutely right. Um, the three main causes of sea level rise are exactly as, as the answer said. The first one, melting of the ice sheets. Um, also melting of land-based ice, as you can see in this picture, glaciers, snow caps, that, that type of thing. Um, and also as the oceans absorb so much more of, um, of the, of the uh, as the oceans absorb, absorb so much um, heat, water expands and you have that sort of thermal expansion of water. So those are the, the three main causes. And um, but of course, everyone who also said climate change is, is also very correct because it's only because we have um, this very extractive uh, fossil fuel based economy that pumps a bunch of greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide and methane into our atmosphere that we're even sort of in this uh, situation. And of course, the greenhouse effect is something that we most definitely need uh, to survive on this planet. Um, it's something that you know, helps keep our atmosphere warm. The issue is now that we, you know, in order to fuel our economy and build our society, uh, all of those heat trapping gases sort of have, well, we pumped more of that into the atmosphere and it's sort of staying in there and warming our planet and causing uh, global warming. And that leads to all of the changes that we are, we are seeing now. And so I guess my second question is, I'd love to get a sense of, are you concerned about sea level rise? And so you can go right back to the exact same um, 
the exact same page and it should have switched over to this question. Wow, so we've got seven responses so far. Everyone's saying yes. Nine. This is really, really quite wonderful. I have to say, I do this, I do uh, a version of this talk in Florida and you actually get quite a few people that say no, we're not sure. So it's really overwhelming to kind of to see this response um, from, um, you know, especially in a place like Florida where that that flood risk is, is very, very present and very, very direct. Okay, just give a few more seconds here. Okay, wonderful everyone, thank you so much. So yeah, sea level rise is, um, as I mentioned before, it's sort of here. And what you're looking at on your screen is what we call the unified sea level rise projections. Um, and this is essentially the you know, four counties in South Florida, West Palm, Broward, Miami-Dade, and, um, and Monroe County, where, where the keys are. They kind of came together to put together this sort of regional, you know, uh, these regional, uh, these projections for the South Florida region. And, um, and it's essentially to sort of facilitate planning and adaptation. And so what you can see here is, is you know, if we sort of take ourselves right, you know, we're here at 2020 or 2022, you can see four really distinct paths. And those paths, of course, really depend on how well we're able to mitigate, um, you know, some of the, some of the, you know, <laughs> it depends on um, how well we're able to mitigate and actually, you know, stop. Um, some of those, um, um, the, you know, the continuation of these heat trapping gases, you know, you know, being emitted into our atmosphere. Um, and it's, it's quite a scary set of projections because, you know, if we're here at 2020, you know, in less than you know, 20 years, we can see anywhere between 10 to more than a foot of sea level rise uh, in Miami. And so that really has, as I said, as I mentioned, you know, uh, the decision makers, people in Miami are really struggling to kind of well, deal with this issue. Um, I know quite a few people uh, in my research group who, you know, I, I've, I've often thought that, you know, using the NOAA high uh, projection was, um, you know, was a little bit more on the, um, you know, not on the not so conservative side, but I've known researchers now who are really, you know, kind of thinking that, you know, the NOAA extreme might actually be a real uh, scenario for, for Miami as well. And so um, the situation in, in, in Miami is, you know, really rapidly um, accelerating, not only because of the, not only, especially because Florida has a, a very special kind of geology. Um, our rock underneath us is not solid, it's porous. And so water can come right, uh, water doesn't necessarily stop um, at the coastline. It comes up from underneath and you know, comes up on land as well. And so we have flooding from, from you know, all, all different sides. And, and these are some pictures of you know, what it can just be on a, on a normal day. This is more or less the sort of tidal flooding. You, know, you can see it's about ankle, uh, ankle depth level, um, but it's salt water, right? So it's not particularly great for sidewalks, for cars. I've known people who have um, their bikes completely destroyed uh, from that. Um, and then also we have, uh, as I mentioned, uh, flooding that comes from rain because, you know, the water just doesn't have anywhere to go. It can't really drain out anymore. It has resulted in quite a few people losing their cars as well. And again, this is not a hurricane. So that's what I think is really usually associated with some of these types of flooding. The fact that this is now becoming a bit more of a nuisance for South Florida um, has really changed the way that I think people are, are thinking about these issues. And so, um, yeah. Uh, another question, have you experienced any type uh, of flood, uh, flooding? Um, in case you uh, have joined late um, in the chat, there is uh, the instructions. You can go to menti.com and then use the code there to, to participate. Wow, great. Uh, not great that you've experienced flooding, but um, just interesting to see the results. So it's looking like we've got about three quarters of people who've answered, 75% um, saying that they've experienced flooding, um, but a slightly 
now of those in the no category kind of growing a little bit as well. Yeah, flooding, folks. So for those of you who have experienced flooding, it is just not fun. I mean, just at all. It gets into, especially if it's entered your home. Um, it is just really dreadful to deal with. In Florida, we have also, you know, it's very, very hot. So if there is kind of flooding in your home and you haven't aired out your, your home or your apartment uh, uh, well enough, that could lead to mold issues. And so it's really just uh, quite a cycle. Um, okay, I'll give maybe another 10 seconds for this. Great, thank you everyone. So um, I wanted to kind of orient you a little bit uh, to where Miami actually is and why we have the flooding problems that we have. And so um, pretty much up until this part here, um, this is pretty much where the, you know, when I say Miami, I mean the county of Miami-Dade or Miami-Dade County. It's this really small sliver of land um, that's just right on the coast. Um, and you can see it right uh, that the Atlantic Ocean, Biscayne Bay is right on this side. And then we have this massive, uh, beautiful uh, freshwater wetland known as the Everglades on the other side. Um, and as I mentioned before, we've got this porous rock underneath us. And so we're dealing with water from all sides here uh, on the coastal side on our sort of Western urban development boundary um, and also from underneath us as well. And so I really wanted to get a sense of, you know, from residents themselves, um, you know, how are they thinking about this? Is flooding an everyday problem for them? Are they thinking that they might want to move? Are they concerned at all about, about sea level rise? Um, and, and, and mostly, the, and, and again, the, the interest in doing this is because flooding has really increased over the last five years, um, again, from all of these different sources that I, that I mentioned. And so what you're looking at here is uh, a map, again, of Miami-Dade, but also all of the little red um, points represents the home addresses of the participants that um, elected to participate in these longer sort of interviews. Um, so the interviews were conducted uh, through Zoom. Uh, they took place uh, in early last year between February and May uh, 2021. Um, and so it was quite difficult to get people to participate in these interviews actually. Um, and they kind of went for around maybe 50 minutes, the shortest being about 30. Some people, uh, when we they you know, started chatting, they wanted to talk for quite a long time. So we did have some long interviews that went for about an hour and a half. But I think what I really wanted to point out with, uh, with this map is that for the most part, when we, even in, in, in the media and the news that is sort of circulating uh, in Miami and locally, you know, this sea level rise issue has this, um, I guess, has this reputation for being a primarily a coastal issue. And so, you know, it's really something that people in Miami Beach are dealing with, people, something people in Key Biscayne or the Florida Keys are dealing with. Um, but I really wanted to actually try to find as much as a geographically diverse set of respondents. Um, and so what you're seeing on the map is, you know, we have a few people who are uh, on the beach or in these sort of coastal areas, um, but we have a lot of, of people who are also inland as well. Um, and you can't really see it well from this map, but something that's really unique and interesting about Miami is in addition to, again, these sort of three different sides of water, the Atlantic side, the Everglades, and underneath us, we also have all these little canals kind of running through uh, the city. Our, 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 water, our water is highly managed in, in South Florida. And so, you know, around, uh, you know, some of these areas, you'll, you'll notice that um, some people have uh, sit on, uh, they, they sort of live on these canals. Uh, in a very Venice-like way. Um, the majority of the respondents came from the city of Miami, which is essentially this sort of area right here, uh, but that's really what this breakdown is, is showing you here. We only actually had about three people who were in around uh, Miami Beach, and this is actually Key Biscayne. So not so many coastal um, uh, residents and a lot more of residents who we would consider inland, resident, uh, inland um, residents. Um, so who exactly participated in this um, in this study? As I said, it was really difficult to, to get people um, to um, participate uh, in the study. Um, 
just because of the nature of you know trying to recruit people during during the pandemic. You know, I wasn't able to really go out to community events or, or anywhere uh, to kind of you know speak to people and tell them you know what are the types of questions they'd be answering and what are the types of um, you know, what what they can really sort of expect. But we did manage to get forty people, and we did manage to get uh, again uh, that you know uh, a pretty di geographically diverse uh, sample. Um, but unfortunately, our, our, our sampling methods were not able to really representatively capture some of the racial and ethnic groups um, in Miami. Miami, again, is, a, is an interesting place because a lot of the residents are foreign born. Um, and so the Hispanic Latino population is probably around 60% of the population, but they only represent about 33% of um, uh, of, of people. And the way that we managed to actually get people into these interviews was we, you know, actually we talked to a lot of community leaders, we talked to a lot of the resilience uh, groups in Miami and, and people who are really focused on climate adaptation. They, you know, tried to recruit people for, for this survey. And, um, and so it really was kind of a, a community effort. We worked with different nonprofits as well. Um, and and you know really exhausted our our, our, our um, the, the contacts that we had available uh, to us, but despite that we were still able to get a sample of about fifty percent renters and owners, um, really to try to give us a, a sense of you know uh, how does you know, mobility decisions how do migration decisions differ based on you know whether or not you have a strong attachment uh, to an area or you're actually physically tethered to um, uh, physically tethered to an area in, in the form of your home. Uh, in terms of the age range, again, a very diverse uh, range here, the youngest participant being 19 years old and all of the oldest participant being around uh, 76 years old. Uh, for household median income, also have a, a pretty uh, a good distribution here. Uh, the under 52,000 mark, that is the county median, the Miami-Dade County's um, household median income. That's where most of our participants um, fell into, into that bracket. But then we also had um, some high income earners um, up as, as well. So what you're looking at here are uh, four different maps, all of Miami-Dade County, and each little diamond represents the home address of one of the participants from the interview. Um, but I wanted to, again, get a sense of like how prevalent flooding is right now for, for people in Miami. Um, and how does that differ based on source? Because as I mentioned, it can be from rain, there's tidal, there's hurricanes, all kinds of uh, different sources of flooding in Miami. Um, and overwhelmingly, um, over the past five years, 30 residents said that they had experienced some kind of flooding from a rainfall related event. And that's what you're seeing in, in map A. Um, the amount of people who had uh, experienced flooding from a hurricane um, or a coastal storm is around uh, a little less than half, about 14 people. Um, and I should say that, you know, in the past five years, which is, you know, what this question was sort of um, asking uh, about, there hasn't really been a hurricane in Miami. There's been a bit of a, a tropical, there was Hurricane Irma, but it wasn't necessarily a really direct hit to the area. And then we have about eight residents who mentioned they've experienced tidal related flooding that maps on really well to some of the coastal uh, residents, but also, you, and again, it's not quite clear from this map, but it also maps on to the residents who are actually right on, um, or living near a canal. And only about six residents said that they had experienced no flooding at all in the last five years. So this was a really interesting breakdown. Uh, what you'll notice is that these numbers do not add up to 40. So residents were able to specify different types of flooding events. Um, and in the residents who actually mentioned all three, rain, hurricane, and tidal events, uh, something really interesting emerged. Uh, all three of those residents, um, again, who, who said that they had experienced rainfall-related flooding, flooding from a hurricane, uh, and flooding from tidal events, all three of them mentioned that they'd seen fish dead in the street. And I, I thought that was perhaps co coincidental, but again, really, you know, uh, getting towards this, I guess, urban legend that's sort of emerging in Miami um, with this headline, you know, did a Miami man really catch a fish in South Beach flood water yesterday? I mean, I don't really know, but it's pretty, it's pretty likely. Um, these are some of the images that, uh, this is a, a rather famous image now of an octopus who ended up stranded uh, because um, uh, during one of the tidal floodings in the basement of a, an apartment in Miami Dade. And so these three different, uh, these three residents, one from Doral, Miami Gardens and Shorecrest, uh, these are all, uh, Doral and Miami Gardens uh, are, are very much uh, neighborhoods that are in uh, Miami. Shorecrest is the only sort of coastal uh, neighborhood. 
But these are the stories that sort of emerge. So from this, um, uh, uh, from a resident from Dural, he said, most recently, most recently, like one year ago, there was a full moon, there was a high tide and it rained and the water flowed down the streets for blocks and blocks and blocks. I even took a video because it was crazy. I had to park my car somewhere else. I had to call out of work because it didn't drain the next morning. It stayed like that for over 48 hours. You could see fish going through the streets of Doral Boulevard that had come up from the canals. Um, and the same thing for the next resident in Miami Gardens. Um, he also uh, sits on, he, uh, his home is actually on a, a canal and he has a seawall in the back of it. And and so he said that, um, you know, we see the water rise, especially in the king tides. It comes up to the wall. It rises up to uh, up to my mall. He's talking about his seawall. However, unless it rain rains with that, then it's coming over uh, the wall. And so I asked him if he'd actually seen it come over the wall. And he said, yeah. So, you know, you have fish in there. You can see the little fat fish swimming in the pond on the grass. It's it's pretty weird and, and, and quite um, and, and quite freaky. Um, and then finally, from the, uh, a resident from Shorecrest, she was actually talking uh, about Hurricane Irma here. Um, and she said, I remember the last, uh, I want to say the last hurricane we had in 2017. Um, just skipping forward a little bit, I'm not sure if I'm right. Uh, we went for a walk, there was, you know, dead fish. Um, and so, you know, for me, these stories, I mean, I, I really couldn't have anticipated this at all. Um, but for me, there's just something so quite unnerving about, you know, animals from another part of uh, you know, another world almost, you know, the mar marine life washing up uh, on, on shore. And so um, this really inspired uh, the, the, the title of this presentation. Um, I knew this was in here somewhere, but this is uh, exactly what I was referring to before um, in terms of our, the geology that we have in, in Miami. Um, and so, um, you know, in a normal coastal city, somewhere like New York, perhaps, a seawall would actually help keep flood water out. In a place like Miami, a seawall would not because we have this sort of porous limestone foundation where the water can uh, sort of seep uh, sort of underneath and, and up on the, on the surface as well. Um, so I want to show you a series of flood maps. Um, I've been working with researchers at the U uh, UC Irvine, and we have been trying to um, put all of these different drivers of flooding together, the you know, rainfall, tidal flooding, and storm, um, coastal storms uh, together to kind of create a map that would um, uh, you know, really help some of our residents understand what the future may hold. And I think what's really great about um, some of my collaborators is that in addition to sort of, you know, making this model, they had a really intuitive way of kind of explaining what those flood depths are. And so you'll see this legend at the bottom here kind of corresponds to, you know, different parts of your body, ankle depth, ankle knee, knee waist. And, and we've since used these maps um, essentially to kind of you know, get residents to maybe understand, um, you know, what flood depths can they expect at their homes um, in the future. So what you're looking at here is, you know, just a one meter uh, or three, around three, about three feet of sea level rise in Miami. You kind of can't really make out too much here, um, but I'll point out to you that there is quite a bit of, you know, ankle depth and ankle knee related flooding in these sort of coastal areas. And here you can see a little bit more some of those canals that I that I mentioned. This is the Miami River. Um, you can see little pockets of, um, of flooding there. Now, as we transition to two meters of sea level rise, so drastically uh, different situation where we have lots of people, uh, especially on you know, the Western side where you wouldn't expect uh, that flooding. But again, all of those factors that I uh, described earlier, that's where you know, some of this flooding is, is, uh, it's a, is, a, is, it's a result of the water on all these different sides. Um, you can kind of see that Miami Beach, uh, Key Biscayne, just really quite inundated. And these areas that are not flooded, this yellow area here, this, these are the highest points in Miami. That's what we call the Atlantic Coastal Ridge. Um, and you can see that they are um, at this point still not uh, particularly flooded. Um, but as we move into a three meter scenario, which is a very high, uh, very high sea level rise um, scenario, about 10 feet or so, um, uh, you can see that um, really it's very much only those areas above 10 feet um, that are um, 
you know, still not inundated. And this is again, more of the sort of long-term inundation for sea level rise. This is not um, kind of like daily uh, flooding, but we kind of wanted to do something to that effect. And so this is the extreme event model. This is uh, what we call that hundred year flooding, the uh, um, fl a flood event. So again, still a bit more extreme than the actual flooding that is you know, ongoing uh, in Miami. But what you can see here, and even a, a zero meter, a baseline uh, sort of scenario, you can see that there are actually a lot of places across Miami that are, um, that have at least some pockets uh, of flooding. And, and for the most part, it is mostly this sort of ankle depth or ankle knee level of, of flooding. And that doesn't really change too much as we move into one meter, um, but you do see the same areas that were inundated in the last, um, model kind of uh, also picking up that level of flooding as well. Um, and then again, this is um, with a two meter scenario. Um, and then finally, a three meter uh, scenario. Um, I realize now that this is actually um, a different, uh, this is actually not the correct map. We've since updated our, our, our model. Um, so I'm sorry about that, but it actually does reflect very well um, the, uh, the previous, uh, um, the inundation modeling as well. Um, okay, so what kinds of effects did people um, did people describe? Um, for the most part, for the most part, um, most participants described some type of neighborhood uh, related flooding. Just kind of seeing flooding in and around their neighborhood didn't necessarily uh, affect uh, them. Um, also, half of our participants mentioned some kind of uh, street level flooding or. Uh, flooding that actually has prevented them from reaching their de uh, destination, has caused some kind of traffic. Um, I've actually seen this happen in real time where there's just sort of after a rainfall event, there is a, a lot of flooding uh, in the um, in the area. And um, people just kind of do U-turns and try to go the other way, which is really not the best thing for people to be doing, but it, you know, it happens. The other option is to you know, kind of get stuck or wait for the water to recede or, you know, kind of risk your car as well. Um, about eight different participants mentioned um, that they had some kind of housing um, uh, flooding uh, um, in, you know, in and around their housing complex. About six different participants mentioned um, home, actual damage to their home. Uh, four participants mentioned sort of car damage where it's, you know, kind of entered their car, but three participants mentioned that the flooding was so severe that their engines, um, you know, flooded their engines and their cars needed to be totally replaced. Um, about five uh, participants mentioned, uh, you know, just having higher insurance rates because of the uh, flood risk. And uh, three people actually mentioned being trapped in their homes um, or their relatives have been trapped in their homes because the flood water was just really too high, something uh, you know, to, to, to sort of venture out into, something that I also noticed in these instances, a lot of residents mentioned just being generally really scared of the flood water because they weren't sure if there had been electrical outlets um, if, if, you know, if there was a down electrical pole somewhere or, you know, if that would cause them, um, that would, you know, cause even further damage or, or injury or injury to them, I should say. Um, so how are people across Miami adapting? For the most part, for people who did sort of mention some kind of adaptive response, they mentioned that they have, you know, alternate traffic routes in their mind that have uh, contributed to really a, a longer commute. Um, that they just generally avoid places known to flood. They uh, end up moving their cars to, you know, either a higher elevation or garages. Um, they wait the flood out, simply just have to sit and wait. Um, and a few, and two people mentioned that they were thinking about purchasing SUVs um, as a result. Um, in terms of events that, um, you know, people kind of signaled, you know, when would they, you know, think about, uh, you know, what, what might signal to them that it's probably time to leave. About eight different people mentioned a catastrophic hurricane. And a lot of these people had been through uh, Hurricane Andrew, which was a very uh, catastrophic hurricane, a category five in the early 90s. Um, some people were a little bit more vague. They just said more flooding, increased flooding. A, a few people mentioned like flooding actually affecting the structural integrity of their home. Um, a few people also mentioned drinking water because along with all that flooding that we have, it also can contaminate our uh, aquifers. Um, and if, uh, a few other people mentioned some economic signals as well. So this big question of who actually wants to leave Miami. 
Well, for the most part, and you know, talking about right now or within the next few years, about four people mentioned that sea level rise is a pro sea level rise and its related flooding is a big enough problem now that they would consider moving or they are planning on moving uh, within the next you know few months or within a year. Um, however, when I asked this question again later on, about 75% of all residents said that, yeah, if sea level rise continues to uh, accelerate, if this continues to be an issue, if there is no adaptation, they would have to consider moving. Um, so I wanted to end with just a few different quotes on what are some of those reasons that people mentioned. Um, you know, some people talked about um, we need to eventually move because the values of our homes are going to drop. I just don't think Miami Beach as it exists today will exist um, or it won't be that way in the future. Um, if it's really that bad, it's going to affect the house and it's going to cost more to fix the house and handle the flooding. Yeah, at that point, I'd have to consider other options. And, the final, and finally, I've lived these horrible events in the last two years that make me have a more pessimistic or more sense of urgency. In terms of people who want to stay, and I and actually I have to say I was quite surprised there weren't more people who said that they wanted to stay. I want to also point out that the average median um, amount of time that people had lived in, or excuse me, the median amount of time that people had lived in uh, Florida at this point was around 21 years. So this isn't a very transient population. It is a population that actually lived in Miami for quite some time. Um, in terms of reason to stay, some people said that they feel safe uh, because they're far from the water itself. Um, age happened to be a factor with some of the older residents not wanting to kind of deal with moving at their age. Um, and family being a, another um, very uh, another um, prominent reason why some people have not would not consider moving. Um, my wife and I have talked about it in the past, oh, let's move on, but we never went past the serious phase of thinking about it because in the end, family always keeps us over here. And I wanted to end with this really final quote. This is from the youngest member, um, excuse me, the youngest uh, participant in this set of interviews. It was really interesting to me because in her, um, in her interview, she was one of the people who'd mentioned really, really bad uh, flooding for her groundwater apartment. Her and her mom, they live in an apartment and they, from just a normal rainfall event, um, the flooding entered their apartment and they had to move all their furniture and take it out and dry it out and all kinds of things. And so I thought that, you know, you know, uh, during the course of the interview that she would say, no, I, I probably want to leave Miami at some point. But actually, she said this, in my point of view, I feel that no matter where we move, there will still be a climate crisis anywhere. Fires, floods, like any, like anything like that. So, I mean, we're going to have to figure it out and solve it one way or another because there's always an issue everywhere. And because I know that there are a lot of uh, younger people in the audience, I kind of wondered, you know, do you agree or, or disagree with the sentiment? I mean, how do you really feel about this? I think something that really, um, really resonated with me, that statement is, you know, just the intergenerational, you know, uh, injustice that climate change means for younger generations um, and, and, and what it means to kind of sort of live uh, with those consequences. Um, and so I'd really love to sort of get your thoughts on that. Again, you can go back to the, the Menti page. It should have progressed uh, to this question if, if anyone felt like responding. Mm. Wow, yeah. I think that this is, um, this particular young woman really opened my eyes to um, just the, yeah, just the, the um, there's a no and, and agree, just the, the types of, of, the types of dilemmas that I think this younger generation has to sort of deal with. Yeah, sort of, not entirely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, completely. There are definitely some places at more at risk than others, but I agree. Right. Well, um, with that, um, we can talk a little bit more about that in, 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 in the special uh, session, but I wanna thank you all so much for, for uh, sharing your thoughts on that. Um, you know, I think we'll just sort of end on this note that, you know, 
for me in the work that I do in South Florida, I've been lucky enough to really, um, you know, see this sort of youth movement rise in Miami. And it's been probably, probably the one thing that gives me hope more than any, more than anything. Um, but I know that, you know, there are these international, um, you know, these, you know, these conferences that are, you know, that occur on, a, on an annual basis, and it doesn't really seem like they're really pushing through, but I would just encourage you to keep up that pressure because, you know, in the sort of backdoor commentary from Miami Beach and the city of Miami officials, it's this pressure uh, that's actually gotten us anywhere uh, in the last uh, two years. I mean, it seems like we're not making enough strides, but, you know, they are hiring resilience officers. They are taking these things, uh, you know, as serious as I, as I think I think they want to, to take it. But in those instances, it's really the youth, um, the youth pressure that's really made any of those changes um, sort, of, sort of happen. And, and ultimately, this is our future. This is the world that we are uh, inhabiting and, and sort of have to uh, uh, really live in. Um, so on that note, um, it's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much uh, for being here. Um, and I will so happily take any of your, your questions now. Nadia, thank you so much. That was a really wonderful sort of blending of both kind of the, the natural science of flooding and impacts and, and some of the social science uh, and kind of the survey results were, were quite enlightening. Um, We've got uh, some time for, for, for questions, comments, reflections. Feel free to either put them in the chat window or just uh, raise your hand and um, uh, either, either physically or the little icon within Zoom and, and we can certainly call on you. Yes, uh, Carol, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. I would like to ask, as that since flooding is so common in South Florida, does the government do anything to help to solve this problem? And then, of course, I also wonder is that is there anything that we can do that help to solve this problem? Yeah, wonderful question. Um, so. Um... I would say that the South Florida government, and, and, and I think one of the challenges of Miami is that uh, even though it's one county with about 2.7 million people, 2.8 million people, there are 34 different cities within that county. And so the government there is actually all of these very small municipalities who don't necessarily work together on this issue. And so we're leading, we, you know, where some leaders have kind of emerged a little bit Miami Beach, uh, some to some degree the city of Miami as well. They have resilience officers who, um, who actually I just read a tweet before we came on here, uh, before I hopped on this presentation that uh, the third Miami resilience officer in the last two years has just quit. Um, so that kind of tells you a little bit about the political situation that they're really navigating. Um, I think they are, we have this wonderful research collaborative. I mean, I, we work across, you know, the, the different um, resilience offices within the government, um, within the South Florida uh, municipalities, I should say, um, and across universities and different nonprofits. Um, so there seems to be an interest in, in putting together these ideas, but for the most part, a lot of the you know, they have a sea level rise strategy. Um, it's actually a, a really interesting one. I highly encourage you to look up the Miami-Dade County sea level rise strategy because they've kind of shifted into this, um, this series of plans that uh, basically accommodate water to sort of live with water as opposed to keeping water out. How they will actually get to there, I'm not totally sure yet because it's a it's it's a, it's basically a really big re-envisioning uh, a real large transformation of what South Florida actually looks like right now um so a lot of this is still I guess kind of in the planning stage not necessarily in the implementation stage um but we would really like it to be in the implementation stage um and in terms of what you can do I would say I mean as I said you know kind of in my ending comments where I've seen you know the reason that we have a resilience officer, a, ch a chief heat officer, um, the only reasons we kind of have these things is because the youth movement in Miami has really put pressure. There was, you know, before the pandemic, they were out there every Friday. Um, 
every Friday protesting in front of City Hall, either Miami Beach or City of Miami. And, you know, what we were sort of hearing from, you know, behind the scenes is that that is what would allow some of the bureaucrats uh, in those um, in those offices to actually try to push through some of the some some changes. And so, I mean, I think that is still, you know, just just about the one thing that we can do just constantly you know maybe scream about it that this is our future and, and we really need change thanks nadia good that's a uh, yeah kind of sobering sobering response and a great question from carol that's um there's a, a a kind of comment or question from from richard in the um in the chat window nadia i don't know if you wanted yeah. to just uh, reflect upon that yes definitely yeah, we can move, but we can't escape it. It's big. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And so in, in, in that sense, um, Richard, I would say that, you know, the one thing that I do like about the Miami-Dade County strategy is they're really well aware, and, and based on those maps that I kind of pointed out, I mean, this water has to go somewhere and this water will go somewhere. And so they are really shifting their strategy into trying to accommodate it uh, and trying to live, uh, live with it. It will be a massive transformation um, because it's basically trying to, basically create more Venices, create more canals, allowing, um, allowing the space for flooding to, to, to sort of occur. It's, it's going to be a different way uh, to, to, to live in South Florida, but I agree. Um, it's, um, it is the world that we have now. Yeah, yeah. Good. I see uh, Devin's got his hand raised. Devin, do you want to come in? Yes. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask if you considered um, South Florida residents, the fact that there's the phenomenon of part-time residents and sort of the snowbird effect that occurs there. And um, you mentioned that your research occurred during parts of the pandemic. And I was just curious if um, you looked at like the impacts of the most recent sort of influx of folks moving down to Florida and also just um, sort of this idea of like the involvement and I guess, commitment to this area if there's so many part-time residents and if any of your respondents sort of had um, that, I guess, characteristic or not, and if that came up for your work. Yeah, fantastic question. Um, so all of my residents who participated were full-time residents. Um, and something that I noticed in the first, in, in the maybe five or so conversations that I did is I actually, because there were many residents moving into Florida at that time, I actually um, began to restrict, um, you know, uh, participation from residents who had lived in uh, Miami less than a year at that point, because I felt that they, uh, I had someone in the initial set of uh, participants who had lived in Miami for about six months and just didn't really um, have a good sense of, of, of flooding. Uh, I mean, they kind of did mention a few a different flooding you know, events to some degree, but in terms of the, the questions were really geared at, you know, trying to make this connection. And I didn't really get into it in the presentation, but of like past flooding experience versus like what they're seeing now, how is it a bit different? Does that cause more alarm? And how is that shaping some of the, uh, the decisions to move or stay in the long-term? Lee, yeah, go ahead. Um, this is so interesting, Nadia, and I, I wanted to go a slightly different direction, which is that I one of the things when we were talking to you about speaking was that you approach this research through interviews, right, through the human experience, as opposed to many of our presenters, you guys will all see are doing it through data or modeling or sort of this more, and I'm just curious, I don't even know what question I want to ask, but I just can only imagine that that actually also took an emotional toll on you, right, in the sense as an interviewer absorbing what is amounts to a lot of climate information and climate anxiety. So I, I don't know if you have anything to share, because I think about our youth also, interviewing would be a great way for youth to sort of capture the climate experience wherever, whether it's here in Maine or somewhere else, but with a warning, right, that it, it, it must be hard. Absolutely. Thank you so much for asking that question, because I mean, it's probably my biggest it's something that I talk to you about with lots of researchers who want to pursue this line of inquiry using, you know, uh, interviews. It was really actually quite difficult because I also asked questions about the pandemic. I asked questions about, you know, how did you feel maybe, you know, pre-pandemic versus now? Um, and so there were just, you know, people really opened up 
in these in these interviews. And and you know, I think perhaps me a little naively, I didn't think, you know, asking some questions about whether or not you want to move or what might consider what might be factored into these moving decisions. Um I, I maybe I, as I said, yeah, perhaps a little naively didn't necessarily think about all the types of experiences that people would, you know, the, all the types of ways that people would answer that question. Um, and it did get into some very, yeah, very emotionally. Um, yeah, I mean, there were there were some interviews that definitely broke my heart in, in, in some in some ways. And um, um, and so I would always try to leave a bit of, of time um, in between in between them. Um, and, and just and it's, for example, some of the residents who had lived in Miami for quite a long time, who were seeing these impacts and, and more or were more or less in the resident um, more, we're more or less in these areas that are kind of more ripe for this climate gentrification phenomena. They really describe just these huge transitions uh, of Miami through time. Um, and so a lot of the older residents um, had, yeah, had these, you know, had these you know, incredible stories. I mean, I felt quite lucky that people even wanted to share as much as they did uh, with me, but I do kind of warn people now and, and something that I, uh, try to make a little bit or something that I think is really dear to my heart uh, with this transdisciplinary research is I do think that we probably, you know, if this is the direction that we as researchers want to go into, we probably do need a little bit more of psychological sort of counseling type of training because a lot of what I was doing in those interviews actually was kind of letting people sit with some of their emotions, um, kind of validating some of their experiences. Um, and that is actually only stuff I learned because my, you know, fiance is a clinical psychologist and I would have had no other, I've had no training in, in, in that at all. So thank you for the question. Yeah, it's um, one of the researchers um, and when I spoke to this about in the Miami community, he called it heart work. He said that it's, it's, um, it is something that happens when you become involved with, communi with, with communities. We don't really often talk about the hard work that researchers um, end up engaging in, but um, yeah, it's, it's not something that we prioritize, but I really do hope that changes. Great, thanks, Nadia. And I think Lee's comment in the chat uh, uh, relays the sentiments that a lot of us are feeling right now. Um, Given the time, uh, and like I said in the beginning, uh, we'd like to we'd like to reserve a, a portion of this for uh, a youth only uh, um, portion of, of Q and A. But before we excuse the non youth among us, uh, I would like to invite everyone to join us for the next installment in this series uh, on Monday, May second, when we'll be joined by Dr. Alex Desherbinen. Uh, he's the associate director uh, for science applications and a senior research scientist at the Center for International Earth Science Information Network, uh, an environmental data and analysis center within the Climate School at Columbia University. Uh, Dr. Desherbinen uh, will focus on climate migration on a global scale uh, with particular focus given to low-income regions of the world, such as Africa and Central America. Uh, the registration link, thank you, Lee, uh, is in the chat window. Uh, so with that, uh, I'd like to thank uh, everyone for joining uh, and, and certainly uh, invite the youth to stay on for a few more minutes with Nadia to uh, have a, a bit more of a, a focused conversation. Thank you all very much.